South Central Florida, just above the Everglades and northwest of Big Lake Okeechobee. This is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Friday, July the 17th, 2015, and it's a pleasure to be with you on a Friday night. Yes, the weekend is finally upon us, so it's time to get into some Far Out Radio. Our guest this evening is a brilliant man that was last with us in September of 2013. His name is Edson Hendricks, and in fact, he is one of the founding fathers of the Internet. The Internet, as we know it, would not be what it is were it not for Edson Hendricks. And you can learn why and uh, catch his entire story by listening to the interview from when Edson was with us in September of 2013 on our YouTube channel. Just go to faroutradio.com, look for that big Far Out Radio on YouTube graphic, click through, then look for the Playlist tab and look for Edson Hendricks. Edson was with us for two hours talking about his life and his career in computers and the development of the Internet. And no, Big Al Gore had nothing to do with it, so we'll get that out of the way. But we were not going to be talking about computers or the Internet this evening. You see, when you have a brilliant mind mixed with a strong sense of curiosity and you have learned how to learn, the world is just filled with amazing things to research and to learn about. In Marfa, Texas, there is a naturally occurring phenomenon that is called the Marfa lights. These are very bright balls of light that just show up. Now, if you go to YouTube, there are numerous videos that you can see of the Marfa lights. But unfortunately, the videos don't do the topic justice because they do indeed look fake. And a skeptical mind can easily come up with lots of ways that you could easily fake something like this on a video that you could put up on YouTube. However, Marfa, Texas is a seriously rural, wide open place with lots and lots and plenty of nothing. Now, many people have seen the Marfa lights, honest people, but often approach the subject as a skeptic and are genuinely blown away. And uh, as far back as the locals can remember, the lights have been there indicating that this is something natural but not understood. And to the locals, and believe it or not, it's no big deal. When Edson first heard about the Marfa lights, he got very curious and applied his natural skills and abilities. And he went to Marfa, Texas. And I don't think Marfa uh, ever had anyone like Edson come into town interested in their lights. And he's with us tonight to tell us about his experiences and his findings. Edson, welcome back to Far Out Radio. Well, thank you for your kind words, Scott. It's nice to be here. It's a pleasure to have you back, sir. Uh, so let's just start at the beginning. It's in the, when did you first hear about the Marfa lights? And uh, what was it about the subject that fascinated you to the extent that you took a trip all the way out to Marfa, Texas? It's not an easy place to get to. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's not on any well-traveled road. It's uh, kind of off in the um, countryside there. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. I first heard about this phenomenon uh, when I happened upon a book titled uh, Earthlight's Revelation by Paul Devereux. In this book, he described this strange thing that goes on <clears throat> where you have a number of places in the world that often produce this kind of thing, and the number's not very many. There's only a few places. Actually, it can happen. Pardon me, what? It, it can happen anywhere, but uh, there are places where it happens quite frequently. And since Marfa, Texas wasn't too far from where I was, I just decided that one day I'd go down and have a look, and so I did. 
Well, I looked. I was kind of curious as to where Marfa, Texas, is located, and uh, so I looked it up on uh, Google Maps, and it's uh, it's way down there. Uh, if you can pull up in your mind's eye what the state of Texas looks like, it's all the way out in uh, West Texas, and it is actually that part of West Texas that's below New Mexico. So it is actually um, uh, quite a distance south of El Paso. So it's way down there in what generally you would think of as uh, Mexico. Yeah, if you if you can picture Texas, there's the Big Bend area, which is the part to the west that dips down toward Mexico, and Marfa is a bit north of that. So uh, you went out there, and uh, tell us what happened when you came into town. <laughs> well, yeah, I was skeptical. I am, you know. That's just how. That's just my nature, <clears throat> and I. Before I went down there, I had uh, looked around and found this little, because I was wondering about this, found this little booklet that had been put together by a very nice lady who had a shop in Alpine, which is right next to Marfa. The shop was named Ocotillo Enterprises, and the lady's name was uh, Judith Brusky. And her book had interviews um, with individuals from that area, uh, describing their uh, experiences when they had, you know, like close uh, encounters with these bright lights. Not, you know, when they're off in the distance, but when they're somewhere right nearby. And so this book was all filled with those descriptions, and I found that just fascinating. It was a little difficult for me to believe. So I stopped by uh, Marfa on my way back on a business trip from, I guess it was uh, somewhere in San Antonio, I suppose, um, and um, went into Judah's shop and met her for the first time and discussed this with her. And my intentions on that trip were not to try to see these lights because I didn't think it would be possible. And... Uh, I was on a business trip, after all, and I didn't have all that much time. But um, So I told Judith I was going to spend the night there in Texas. I'd, I'd just spend the night in the motel, and I wasn't planning to go out to the Mar- – they, they have a viewing site out there. The Texas Department of uh, Transportation has set up a uh, – a little park with some, you know, uh, visitor center and picnic tables and whatnot alongside the road where people can go and watch for the lights. And uh, so uh, I, I told Judith I wasn't planning to uh, spend any time there, but she said, "Oh no, you should, you should. People come through here and sound just like you, and and then they'll go out there to the visitor center." and uh, come back with these uh, really amazing stories of what they saw. So I said, okay, I will. (laughs) And I went out, and she was right. There they were. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I had never seen anything like it. It was not an illusion. It was not car headlights. No, this was something completely different. And uh, so I went back and told her the whole thing, and that got the whole thing started, and then it went from there. Well, one of the things that surprised me about this and, and was that when I was I did some research on it this afternoon was that uh, they don't show up all the time, and sometimes they show up at uh, dusk, sometimes at dawn. Uh, they're really quite unpredictable. So the fact that you were able to you went out there one time and you you got lucky on that one. Did you have to, were you out there for long? No, I was only out there for. I, as I recall, I was out there for sunset, and then I waited for about an hour after it got dark, and there they were. What about that? So describe to us what they looked like to you. Just big, bright, pretty much white balls. Uh-huh. And I can't remember exactly what the ones did the very first time I saw them, but what they'll typically do is they will appear, sometimes individually and sometimes in groups, and then they will move in uh, kind of patterns. They will move in formations, sometimes in a line. I've seen them, one circling another one, seen them do that. And they can go in any direction at all. And they can be at pretty much any altitude from right down next to the ground on up to, you know, several thousand feet, I guess. I don't know, somewhere up there, somewhere high. 
and uh, and they'll just behave any any way at all. You just have to watch them and see what they do. I was curious about this, and I was I couldn't help but wonder. You know, since people have been looking at these things, seeing them, talking about them for a long time. I, I read this afternoon that the first published account of the Marfa lights was in Coronet magazine in July 1957 issue, and. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, has anyone ever, you know, like, I don't know, jumped on a dirt bike and rode out to where these lights are to <laughs> get closer to it, or they just stand there and look? Oh, people try things like that, sure. But th- th- this is not a very good place to be doing that, and I'll why, tell you why. why. so? Okay. This is an old World War II Army Air Base area. It's now been abandoned. And it's no longer there, and it's now past, you know, grazing land. The trouble is that there were buildings out there, and the buildings had, you know, uh, basements, foundations that were depressed. And you can be walking along there and not even realize it and have a 20-foot fall onto concrete. Oh. (laughs) You know? (laughs) So it's not an easy place to be off-roading. It's not nothing I would recommend. But here's a suggestion that someone recently just offered to me, and I think this is a good one. Someone should run with it. What you could do, you know, these, uh, you know, remote-controlled drones are now very popular, and you can have television cameras on those that radio back the results, and you could get a drone up there and fly the drone right up next to the ball. You could do that. That would be neat. Yeah, I don't. I've never heard that suggestion before. And the fellow who offered it to me is a real smart guy. And uh, so maybe someone will listen to this program and do it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, yeah, that really would be neat. You, you know, speaking of drones, uh, on the Fourth of July, um, where, where we live in uh, South Central Florida, they had a their fireworks show. And uh, just before the show, somebody standing next to me said, "Look at that up there! It's a drone." And I looked up, and there was—I could see these two bright lights, like green and red, blinking back and forth and back and forth. And it was actually kind of distracting because sometimes this thing would go up and then go straight down, and then go up and down and move about. And I guess somebody must have had a camera attached to this thing because it was up there for the entire fireworks show. Yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. That's the, that's the idea. Because a lot of people are using and doing things like that. And you, what that someone needs to do is get one of those down there in Marfa and wait for the lights to show up and go have a good look. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's unfortunate that fakery with video, because it's digital now, is so easy to do. And, you know, I remember when cell phones uh, first uh, came out with a camera attached to it. I thought, boy, that's that's great, you know, everybody will have a camera. You know, and if anybody happens to see a UFO or something flying around or something unusual, strange that looks out of the ordinary, where you kind of slap yourself upside the head and say, "Gosh, I wish I had a camera." You know, almost everybody has a cell phone in their in their pocket now. You know, they can capture these things, and indeed they do. Unfortunately, because it's so easy to use Photoshop and uh, uh, applica- simple application programs like Movie Maker and do all these kinds of things, it's very easy to fake this stuff. And unfortunately. When you see uh, digital images or uh, or digital video, you really can't believe anything you see anymore. Well, um, you certainly can't if it comes from somebody who's not a recognizable name. However, in the case of the Marfa Lights, um, there was a there used to be a television show, uh, the name of which is Sightings. There was Sightings, yeah. and what they would do is they would collect almost always video from private individuals and of unusual stuff like UFO things and things like that, and they'd show them on their program. Well, fate had it that the uh, producers of that television show heard about this Marfa thing and my connection to it, and they called me up and asked me if I could go down there with a group of really uh, network news uh, camera uh, guy, an audio guy, and a field producer, and do a show and hope to get video of the Marfa lights. And, of course, my first question was, well, how many nights are you planning to be there? And he said, well, we can just be there for two nights. And I told him, well, in my experience, you have to be there, and if you're if you're you're out there and you watch every night 
and don't sleep. Uh, keep your eyes open. Um, you'll probably see something about once every week or two, and that's about all. And he said, well, then we'll just have to get lucky. And you know what? They did. <laughs> they got lucky. They got a real good show, caught the whole thing. You can probably find it on the Internet somewhere. I don't know. I have a copy of it. Um, but uh, it has it has um, it has the the lights uh, pretty close and real good video of it taken by a professional news camera crew. And I do the narration. I'm all spontaneous, and you can actually hear in the tone of my voice. You know that uh, kind of awestruck, not just at the lights, which are awesome enough, but also at their luck. You know, <laughs> these guys—they came out, they came down there, and the, the last, the second night, last night we were out there, the lights popped up, and they got them. How about and, that? And that, yeah, and that show was replayed on network television in the U.S. Oh, I think I lost count at twenty-two times. Um, I had people, dis- distant cousins of mine, and so on, contacting my parents, saying we saw we saw him on sightings. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's neat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just looked it up while you were talking, and uh, let's see, it was on September the twenty fifth, nineteen ninety two. Right. And uh, I don't know, you know, a lot of these kinds of TV shows, uh, people put them up on YouTube, so uh, probably on YouTube. You know, or perhaps it's on Netflix as a watch instantly. Uh, Amazon Prime is also another source of, uh, uh, if you're an Amazon Prime member, they oftentimes uh, put up a TV series uh, such as this. Um, so I don't know, folks, if you're, you know, you want to see Edson, you want to hear his description of the Marfa Lights, you know, look up the TV program Sightings and the September 25th, 1992 episode, and you'll find them. I think I'm going to look for it after the show, actually. And the production company was called Sathergate Productions. Sathergate Productions. Sathergate Productions. They were the ones that did it. You know, we are on the Rents Radio Network, and that is uh, started and run by Jeff Rents. And um, when Jeff first started his program, it was called Sightings. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> um. You mentioned something earlier that reminded me of something that I probably should mention to people um, who might want to go down there and try to get either still images or videos of these lights. Um, They don't show up very often around sunset, but they often do show up just before sunrise. And if you time it just right... Um, you can have enough of the dawn sky glow to illuminate the landscape, and the lights will still be going. And if you take if you take photos during that um, probably 15 minute period, you can see exactly where the lights are in the landscape, and it it, it does a really good job of of, uh, of presenting a, a clear image of of the lights and how they fit into the scene there. Now, a lot of people will look at these things and um, say, oh, those are just uh, car headlights. <laughs> yeah. uh, however, these things, you know, uh, move around. Some, I read that sometimes they move very slowly, and other times they can, they can you know, dart all over the place. The, the ones that you saw, were they moving about slowly? Or, well, first of all, did you, was it just one or were there multiples? Because sometimes uh, several of them show up. Yeah, well, you know, you know what, Scott, I've seen so many of these. I, I get confused about which one showed up when, but I've seen them do all of those things. I've seen them shoot around really fast and sometimes just sit dead still and other times move in formation. Um, sometimes they'll be moving along five or six of them in a straight line, and one of them in the straight line will just take off on its own in you know, some direction or other and go somewhere. You know, they'll just, they can just do anything. You know, you never can predict them. Hmm. Yeah. It's strange. Well, you've, you, you've seen them many, many times. How long were you out there? Did... Oh, well, once I, once I started this, I would go down there quite frequently, and I was going to keep doing it, but and, you know, once that sighting television show came out, and uh, the people who lived there uh, were very pleased with that because it attracted a lot of people to their area, which meant tourist business. 
you know, they let me know that they really did not want any scientific explanation for these. They would rather have things just the way they are because their feeling, as they expressed it to me, I didn't agree, but their feeling was that if you have a scientific explanation, that would somehow dilute the kind of mystery and charm about the lights. Well, it may be true. I don't. It wouldn't do that for me, but, you know. That, that uh, could be. Yeah, it wouldn't, wouldn't do that for me either, but, you know, it's their lights and their town, I suppose. Uh, right. They have a, I read that they have a Marfa Lights Festival every year. That's right. I used to place. go down there for the festival um, yearly, and they would stand me up and have people ask me questions and things like that. Nice, nice. They have it on Labor Day weekend. Yeah. So, uh, uh, we're, we have our music playing in the background, so we're going to slide into a break. When you're not looking at the uh, lights in Marfa, is there anything else to do there? Um, tell you what, I'll be thinking about that over the break. Okay, very good. All right, <laughs> okay. we're going to go into our commercial break. If you're just joining us, Edson Hendricks is with us this evening, and we're talking about the uh, unusual, strange, natural phenomenon uh, known as the Marfa lights. It happens in other places, but tonight we're talking about the Marfa lights, and we'll be right back. Friday night. We're having some fun this evening. Edson Hendricks is with us. We're talking about the Marfa lights. Edson was with us back in September of 2013, and we talked about his life and his career in, in the computers and the, his uh, pivotal role, his important role in the development of the Internet. And you can read his story, and it's an amazing story in a delightful book titled It's Cool to Be Clever, the story of Edson C. Hendricks, the genius who invented the Design for the Internet is written by Leanne Jones and beautifully illustrated with uh, just terrific, sweet artwork. And uh, Leanne has been on Far Out Radio a few times. She's a, a, a brilliant uh, private investigator, among other things. And she writes uh, books and writes music. And uh, she's a, really a, a terrific gal. And it's a fun read book. Okay, Edson, so uh, what else is there to do when you're uh, not looking for uh, lights in uh, Well, there? I was going to answer your question you left with about what else to do around Marfa. Um, there's the Big Bend National Park, uh, not very far at all from Marfa, and that place is just gorgeous. That's mm -hmm. certainly worth a visit. So mm -hmm. there's that. And then there's uh, uh, that whole area down around Big Bend is, is very pretty. It has a lot of mountains and things. And there's uh, uh, there's another one, uh, a park, and was it... Uh, uh, Los Padres uh, in in Mexico. So any of those is they're certainly worth a visit. So then you were wondering what else I do. <laughs> oh no, I meant what else is there to do uh, out there? Oh, what uh, else is there to do in Marfa? Right. Uh, you know, well, like I, I said, then, the, that's the, enough. Yeah, the, the 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 place right around Marfa. It's just about the most remote place you're ever likely to see. It's all flat almost completely flat, and there's hardly anything there. I mean, except there's ranches, there's just little towns that are just nothing more than, a, you know, like a intersection of two roads. And, uh, you know, that's it. But, um, and so if you like open spaces and deserted areas, that's your spot. <laughs> but uh, if you want to uh, uh, go to some uh, more typical kind of tourist places, Big Bend National Park is the is certainly worth a visit just on its own. So that would be the place to go. 
So for our listeners, if you're headed out to Big Bend this year for uh, vacation, stop on over to Marfa. You might see some lights. Let's uh, sort of broom aside some of these um, uh, claims. Um, I read that uh, UT Dallas students spent four nights out at Marfa studying, and they concluded that uh, the lights were car lights coming from View Park. And then there was another study by the Aerial Hyperspectral and Reflection Study. That was what it was called, the Aerial Hyperspectral and Reflection Study. They studied there a whopping one night, uh, and they concluded that it was reflected lights from Highway 67. Uh, yeah. And there are also some people have uh, made the claim that uh, what you're actually seeing there is a, a kind of a mirage because the uh, uh, of the of the air air temperature barriers sometimes it gets really cold there at night you know when it had been had been warm and you know it's an optical illusion blah 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 to help us take these apart oh sure um, well in the first place and yeah for sure <clears throat> Excuse me. There's some. Um, it's an arid area, and you'll get a lot of temperature um, sharp gradients in there, and that that will lead to various things like inversion layers that will reflect light. So sometimes you will see illusions uh, of you know ranch lights or car headlights reflecting in strange ways. Yes, that happens, and also just about any time. You can see car headlights standing at the Marfa Lights viewing site. You can see car headlights heading north from Presidio on Route 67 uh, toward Marfa. And those, those, those happen all the time. But if you spend even a little bit of time down there, and, you know, four nights is not enough. But if you spend a little bit of time down there, you can pretty quickly figure out exactly where that road path goes. And then you will recognize when cars are on that road path and know that they're cars. Okay, big deal. And um, and that they do strange things. Like I went up and investigated this one time, and there's a. I finally figured out that there is one place along that road where the car headlights seem to flare up really brightly. So I went up there and had a close look at the road path, and sure enough, that was right where the the inclination and the the path of the road. Aim the car headlights right straight at the Marfa Lights viewing site. <laughs> so, so, you know, and what will happen will be this. People will, will hear about this, um, uh, these Marfa Lights, and they will spend maybe one night down there. They'll be going through, and they'll spend one night, and they'll see the car headlights, <clears throat> and they'll go around and tell people that they saw the Marfa Lights when all they saw was car headlights. That happens a lot. You know, and so when groups of students or somebody uh, come along and claim that uh, they've debunked the whole thing and it's car headlights, well, sure. I mean, 90% of the of the witness reports of Marfa lights, in fact, do refer to car headlights. But that's not the same as to say that there's that there's nothing else there but car headlights. No, there, no, there's a whole different thing there that are not car headlights. And you could ask yourself this question. Witness reports, published reports, you mentioned the Coronet Magazine article, but there are other witness reports, and I checked all this out when I was doing research down there in Marfa, that date back to the earliest settlers in the area. And this was in the 1800s, and that was before there were either automobiles or roads, and the lights were there then, so there. Let alone car <laughs> headlights. Pardon me? Let alone car headlights. Yeah, there weren't any that they, they they saw distant lights. You know, they the original explanation was that they were the they were fires that Native Americans were were making. They had Native Americans in the mountains down there, and they they had fires. And well, no, not that either. <laughs> I read an interesting little anecdote about this. Native Americans uh, of the area thought that the Marfa lights were fallen stars, the Houston Chronicle reported. And it said that the first mention of the lights comes from 1883 when a cowhand named Robert Reed Ellison claimed to have seen flickering lights one evening while driving a herd of cattle near Mitchell Flat. He assumed the lights were from Apache campfires. 
Ellison was told by the area settlers that they often saw the lights too, but upon investigation, they found no ashes or other evidence of a campfire, and that was according to the Texas State Historical Association. Yes, I, I think I'm familiar with that story. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, that it's, I think, you know, there's, there's a very natural tendency that many people have to be dismissive of odd claims and to, uh, that, that they take kind of pride in their skeptical attitude. They, it, to them, it sounds something like intelligence. If you're skeptical, oh, yeah, I've got to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's a, it's it's a little like uh, for for real scientists, it's a little like hygiene. Of course, you do have to have skepticism; if, otherwise, it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, it's just, it's, it, we got our music playing, and I, and I just want to squeeze this in. I we you and I were talking about this via email uh, a few weeks ago, and you told me that I think it was that. Judith's, uh, Judith Kruski's uh, book that there was one anecdotal account of one of these lights that passed through somebody's automobile. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's that all about? And, oh, uh, they'll do anything. I'd like to have that happen, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that terrified the poor driver. Yeah, that's something you don't see every day. No, but that, those lights will go anywhere and do anything. They just, there's no predicting them. Yeah, yeah, just stay out of the way. All right, we're going to take our last commercial break, and we'll be right back in a few minutes with uh, more conversation with our pal Edson Hendricks. Hendricks this evening, and uh, again, I want to mention to you that you can read all about Edson's amazing life in the uh, delightful book, It's Cool to Be Clever, the story of Edson C. Hendricks, the genius who invented the design for the Internet, written by Leanne Jones with uh, just charming illustrations by Anna Ma. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific read. It's very inspirational, actually. All right, Edson, we were talking earlier this afternoon about your take on this, and... Um, you were telling me about something I had never heard about. It's uh, something called, I'm probably going to murder this word, igneous rocks? Uh, say it again. Igneous rocks? Oh, igneous rock, yes. Igneous uh, rock. Igneous rock refers to one of three or four general classifications of surface earth rock material. And igneous rock is typically the remnants of volcanic lava and other kinds of volcano output. So uh, this whole Marfa area is igneous rock. Now, the interesting thing about that is that igneous rock tends to be electrically conductive more than other kinds of rock. And so there are also these electric currents that run through the surface of the Earth and they go by the name of telluric, telluric currents. And they are induced by the interaction of the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. And in some places, these telluric currents get extremely powerful. And those places are almost always where there is uh, igneous rock, and Martha is one of those places. And so um, the chances are uh, that there's an awful lot of electricity going right below your feet there, and I have other reasons for suspecting that, too. So that's, I think, what one of the major ingredients to the cause of the Marfa lights. Well, I also read this afternoon that uh, you're, all, you're on the same page with retired aerospace engineer James Bunnell. 
Yeah, you know, I know Jim. Okay, because he, he happened upon the Marfa lights, and uh, he believes that the Marfa lights are a result of the igneous rock under Mitchell Flat that creates a piezoelectrical charge. And, Did he say uh, that? Pardon me? Is that what he said? Yeah. Oh, okay. I think you might have heard that from me. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim, James Spinell, uh got something that I'd never seen or even heard of before. And I just I sent him an email note. I haven't communicated with him for years, but I just sent him recently an email note, and he said he'd try and dig it up. He remembers what I'm talking about. He, he had set up... Um, a number of robot cameras that would sit there, and every several minutes they would take a photo down there along Mitchell Flat where the Marfa lights appear. One of his photos, just one, shows what appears almost certain to be ground-to-ground -ground lightning, which, it, which by which I mean this. There's what looks like a, a, a good-sized electrical spark, a bolt, coming out of the ground into the air, arcing over and going back into the ground uh, several yards away. I, that's a, that was a new one to me, and I, and I hope that Jim can find it. And if, it, if, I, if he can dig it up, then I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'd love to see that. Uh, do you, well, I mean, what do you think that's all about? Is that just these, these energy currents sort of uh, uh, bouncing from one place to the other off these uh, unique rocks? Sure. Yeah, I think, I th well, what happens, this current is going to shift directions. You see, what's going to happen is that depending upon the uh, what's happening in the upper atmosphere and above the atmosphere up with the solar wind, uh, it's going to be a shifting kind of a thing. And there's various ways that it could shift that I can imagine where you, you'd have, you know, an awful lot of electrical potential across a very small area, and you could easily have a spark go over that. And I think that's what he got. Amazing. Yeah. This afternoon you were telling us about a, uh, a device that you cobbled together with things that you got from a hardware store yeah. uh, that you used to uh, uh, do some of your own uh, scientific testing out the area. Tell us all about that. Well, that's, really actually, that's actually how the whole um, um, sighting television piece on the Marfa lights got started. Yes, I figured that if we have balls of light floating around in the air that are very bright, they have to get power from somewhere. It's not free. Something has to be driving them. And the only thing that could be would be electricity coming through the ground or the air. And so this was, this was when I first got down there and, and spoke with Judith Brusky in her shop there at uh, Akatillo Enterprises. She convinced me I should go out there with... Um, yeah, for a look. And so I went over to the hardware store, and I got a um, uh, about a two-foot diameter big flower pot uh, saucer. And then I went to the Radio Shack and got some wire, and I got a speaker amplifier that was battery-powered that was about the size of a pack of cigarettes. Uh, and uh, I got some tape. <laughs> and a coupling transformer, which you have to use if you want audio to work right. And I wired that whole thing together and taped it up, and I had this jury-built gadget uh, that would um, that, uh, that ought to make sounds if there's, you know, like power coming from somewhere. Well, I took it out there, and sure enough, when I saw and had it turned on, and sure enough, when the Marfa lights appeared, what I heard was not what I expected. What I heard were whistlers. Whistlers are almost always very faint natural radio signals in the audio frequency range. And they, they come from the, from the Earth's magnetic field way up above the atmosphere. But these, I was hearing, were really loud. Well, I got, when I got back home, I got a hold of the, the uh, guys that know all about whistlers, explained this to them, and they denied it. They said, no, 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 the thing that you have there cannot possibly hear whistlers. That's not possible. And I said, I understand why you're saying that, but it does. So, soon enough, one of them said, all right, how about if I meet you down there? And I said, great, come on down. So he, he came down to Marfa, and we met down in Marfa, and uh, waited until the sun went down and turned the thing on, and, and he said, oh, my goodness, you're right, those are whistlers. Oh, my, and they were really loud. 
so he went back to, to his uh, place where he lives, Los Angeles, and he wrote an article for the weekly uh, free tabloid they have there, the L.A. Weekly. And that uh, article was seen and read by the production guy at Sailor Gate Productions, who immediately got on the phone to me and wanted to know if they could send a news crew down there to see if they could get their own video of one of these things for their show, which they'd never been able to do before, and they really wanted to. And I said, fine, meet me down there. You can, I'll, I'll be glad to help and cooperate any way I can. And they did, and they succeeded. Uh, what do whistlers sound like? Uh, I don't know if I can whistle well enough, but it, they descend in pitch. It sounds just like somebody whistling with their lips, oh. but it's a, it has a sharp, uh, a, a sharp, sudden start to it, and then it descends in pitch and trails off in volume. Okay. Right. Yeah. You can now, look it up on the internet. Com- you re- Pardon me? Oh, I was going to go on to something else, but please finish up. Uh, you could you can look it up look up whistlers on the internet you can read all about them okay you you also read about uh, Bing Crosby too um, oh, yeah <laughs> he was a good whistler um, yeah, right. in the beginning of the program you mentioned that uh, there are a few other places on the planet that have a similar the similar phenomenon uh, which uh, what places did you like that were you able to identify no well, the two big ones are uh, Hestelen in Norway their Hestelen lights are quite famous and then there's another one, uh, kind of on the, it's not on the west coast, but it's on the western, it's toward the western coast in central Australia. And those go by the name of the Min Men Lights. But I will hasten to point out that similar things can show up practically anywhere. You know, they sometimes do. And there's just no way to predict what they're going to do. They, they'll just do it. Hmm. Wow. And I'll, it would be, now, when you identify those other places, did they have these um, ingenious rocks in the area? Igneous well? rock? Igneous rocks. I haven't looked into that. I don't know. Hmm. Well, my guess is Australia, probably yes, and Norway, I don't know. I'm not sure what the volcano situation in Norway is, but Australia, I think they do have volcanoes there. Wow, volcanic rock, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the pia- and the piezoelectrical effect. Yeah, Uh it's an amazing world, and uh, when you have a curious mind, as you've learned how to learn things like you have, uh, you know, uh, the world is your oyster. Oh yeah, and I it's 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 been great. I I can't imagine a life going as well as mine. It's if I had it all to do over again, I don't think I'd change a thing. Well, that's a that's a terrific thing to say. Wow. Yeah, I I I'd do everything the same. Alrighty. And uh, again, I want to remind our listeners, if you want to read about uh, Edson's life, it's cool to be clever. The Edson C. Hendricks story, the genius who invented the design for the Internet. Uh, may, are you may retired? I stick some, may I stick something in here? Yeah, sure. Uh, Leanne's book about me is also available, uh, probably from the App Store or somewhere like that, uh, as a e- 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 back or ebook uh, download for the for the uh, uh, the Mac um, book computer. Yeah. And um, uh, I think it's free. And what Leanne told me was that it is now. The most, the number two most popular download in the world. How about that? I did not know that. That's yeah, really I just great. heard it from Leanne. That's great. Edson, we're all out of time. We'll do it again soon. Okay, let me know when. Okay, I will do that. And I enjoy our, our email conversations very okay, much. Okay, we'll keep that up too. Nice talking to you, Scott. Indeed. Take care. That is our program for this evening. Thanks for being with us. Coming up next week, Dean Henderson will be here on Monday. We'll be talking about geopolitics. And then on Friday, Dr. Bernie Siegel will be here talking about uh, how to stay sane in this crazy world. Have a great weekend. Get some downtime, some relaxation time, and do some digging in that gold mine between your ears. We'll be back on Monday with more Far Out Radio. Thank <laughs> you.